When you think about where our industry is today, the challenge of a simplistic message is the biggest one that we face. We're in a time where the oil and gas industry, the energy industry, is as complex as it's ever been, and the public, the public's attention span is as small as it's ever been. I would argue with you that the biggest headwind that the entire oil and gas industry faces today is that one. It's that while we are over here, not just trying to drill a new, complex, long lateral well, we're trying to figure out how to manage water. We're trying to figure out how to work with midstream companies and new large gas plants. We're trying to figure out how to scale up our refineries to handle a whole new onslaught of light, sweet crude. We're trying to figure out how to put gas stations together, have to now comply with new federal standards and RENS credits. We're trying to figure out what to do with all this light, sweet crude and all this excess gasoline to get it to an export port, how to ship it more affordably to get it out to overseas markets. The biggest thing that makes the U.S. and specifically the state of Texas competitive with the rest of the world is the fact that we are strong in each one of those individual areas. You can look around the world and you can find, yeah, certainly the Permian Basin is arguably the most, most prolific, best place to invest oil and gas dollars today. But there are other really great oil fields around the world. You could look and say, well, hey, we've got really great refineries. Well, China's investing billions every year to expand their refining infrastructure and have some state-of-the-art facilities. Same thing in India, same thing in Saudi Arabia. You can look and say, well, import-export capacity. You can look even just other areas of the United States at the ports and what they're investing there. What nobody has is all of it in one place. The combination of our great geology and our great technology to develop new oil and gas. The 430,000 miles of pipelines that allow us to move product across the state of Texas like nobody else in the world can. The six million barrels a day of refining capacity that's being invested in right now to expand to seven million barrels a day of refining capacity over the next three years is the largest single footprint in terms of a state that there is in the world. As I said, our import-export capacity, we're supposed to expand our export capacity on natural gas to nearly 12 billion cubic feet a day by the end of 2021. You put all of these different components together and nobody can, nobody can compete with us. Nobody can compete with the state of Texas. But we have this one gigantic challenge, and it is unequivocally public perception. I've been in the oil business as I was introduced, as uh, Jim talked about. I've been in the oil business 20 years. My first job out of college was with Oxy. My second job out of college was with Marathon. Now, I'm a lowly mechanical engineer. I'm not qualified to drill holes. My job was to look at the equipment, surface equipment. I'm, in fact, my kind of specialty was pressure vessels, heat exchangers, piping system pumps, looking at the reliability of all those assets. If they're corroding, how are they corroding? How do we need to inspect them, manage them, that sort of thing? I remember when I was working for Marathon, I got a chance to talk with our CEO. And this was back in 1999. And our CEO came in and visited with a group of young engineers, and he told an interesting, gave an interesting anecdote. Now, at the time, there was a big controversy going on because reformulated gas was a new standard that the EPA had put in place, and it drove some weird economic things around the country. And Marathon made a ton of money because they had bought a pipeline that ran from the Gulf Coast area all the way up to Detroit where they had some concentration of facilities up there and they were able to provide reformulated gas at the same time some of the facilities up there were going down and Marathon made a ton of money in a six month period. Made so much money that Congress drug the CEO of Marathon up in front of the congressman and grilled him, his name was Corky Frank, grilled Corky Frank about how dare he make all this money on reformulated gas. And I remember watching this on TV, congressman, pointing his finger at Corky, going after him, saying, Mr. Frank, we think that you intentionally managed inventory levels, production, and blend to maximize profits. <laughs> Mr. Frank leans over the microphone and says, I do it every day. He was not bashful about it. But the public perception that somehow Marathon, by simply complying with the reformulated gas standard, had like violated the social contract to produce oil and gas. So I'm having this meeting with Corky, this is a few weeks later, and I asked him about, man, Corky, why is it we can't seem, 
Why are we not out speaking about this? Why aren't we out explaining what we're doing? The investments that Marathon is making in these refineries, in our pipelines, in our exploration and production to provide all this fuel to the market more affordably, driving costs down. But yeah, when the prices are high, we make good money. Why are we not out saying that? And Corky kind of laughs. And he, he almost was like he didn't actually pat my head because he wasn't Joe Biden. He just kind of, <laughs> but kind of figuratively, he, uh, he says, oh, you know, cute that you think that. He said, look, Ryan, in the oil, you know, in Hollywood, any press is good press. Well, in the oil business, any press is bad press. We, want, we don't want people to know we exist. We, we want to put gas in the tank and not worry about us. Well, 20 years ago, that philosophy was acceptable. Today, it doesn't work. Today, with the development of social media, anyone can put a video with any opinion on the internet and it can go viral and a million people can see it and no one questions the validity of the person making the video. Let me tell you a personal story about public opinion. How many of us here in Houston area? A handful of us. Is it, how many of us here were aware of the gigantic tank fire three weeks ago in the Houston area? All right. I live, I, my main office is in Austin. I live in Friendswood, which is just down kind of southeast of, of the Houston area, a little suburb. My main business, our main offices, my personal office is in Pasadena, which, which is neighbor, Neighbors Deer Park. Now, I could see from my office and from my house, I could see the smoke plume going over the, going over the ship channel, going over the city of Houston daily. Now, Railroad Commission had no official responsibility for this facility. It was a, it, the company's called ITC. It's a rent-a-tank program. For those of us who've been in the downstream business, there are a lot of these companies. What they do is they build facilities that just have a bunch of tanks so that if you're Shell or BP or Exxon or somebody, you say, man, I got a lot of product. I got to store it somewhere. I don't have enough tank capacity. You can truck it or pipeline it over to one of these guys, and you rent a tank just like we would rent a, a garage stall for our excess crap, right? So anyway, these guys are a, a rent-a-tank place, and this is a, a group of 15 tanks, and it's basically holding gasoline blend stock, naphtha, some toluene, xylene, but it's basically gasoline, gasoline blend stock. The middle tank had what was caught on fire that, that made the public news. Well, the problem was the public announcements were not very good. The tank caught on fire Saturday night. Sunday morning is when the big smoke plumes started coming up the first, and they caught other tanks on fire. Smoke plume, plumes got worse. Uh, by Monday, the, the public is in a genuine state of concern. Monday afternoon, the new Harris County, Commission, uh, Harris County judge, Harris County's third largest county in the country, the Harris County judge just got elected by accident. How did somebody get elected by accident? Well, Beto O'Rourke swung a whole slew of extra votes, and the long-serving Harris County judge, a guy named Ed Emmett, a guy in his mid-60s, had run Harris County very effectively, was immensely popular across the city, Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, everyone liked him because he was kind of just a shrewd business guy, good at operating a, a county. He was not really a very very big advocate for policy. He was more of taking care of business. Well, the top of the ticket, Harris County swung by 20 points. 20 points Democrats won over Republicans, top of the ticket. Ed Emmett lost by less than one point, but he still lost. So in comes this Harris County judge, Lena Hidalgo. Lena Hidalgo is 28 years old, never had a job. College student. So she's given a press conference. I'm watching this on TV. And she looks like a college kid who's trying to address a natural disaster, has no idea what she's doing. Her county, uh, the, the county emergency management people give an announcement. They don't know, they seem like they're lost. Their public announcement made public concern go through the roof. Because now people go, these guys don't know what they're doing. Bless their heart, the ITC people, good people, their ITC person, they, they've never had to deal with this kind of disaster before. Their person who was handling public communication, she was struggling. The communications were so... Just people looked concerned, they didn't look comfortable, and man, everyone watching this, because this was dominating news, their concern levels were going up. So even though I had no regulatory responsibility, I have tons of friends, family, uh, acquaintances in the Deer Park and Pasadena area, and I started getting phone calls. Ryan, do you know what's going on? I mean, we're getting announcements, man, no one knows what's going on. And I'm actually watching TV going, man, I, gotta, I don't know what's going on. So I said, all right, we'll, we'll find out. The mayor of Deer Park is a guy named Jerry Mouton, he's a friend of mine. So I called up Jerry, I said, Jerry, man, are, how are you doing? Man, Ryan, um, this, this is hard. We're getting a lot of pressure, a lot of questions. I said, tell you what, Jerry, I'll go out there with you. We'll figure out what's going on. Because I'd spent most of my career, spent about two-thirds of my career downstream, about one-third upstream. So Jerry and I hop in my car, and we pull up to the facility. We actually go, the, he has a police escort take us out. We get through the, the security barriers. We go to the incident command center. I'm probably 
200 yards from the fire. I'm in the incident command center. I'm talking to the incident command guys, and I'm asking all questions. What's in the tank? Let me see the process flow diagrams. I want to see what the chemical balance is. Where are the last set of tests you ran? Where are the levels that you've got? How much benzene's there? Any other carcinogens that are present? What monitors are going on? And every, I'm using every bit of experience I had from my, from my time in industry to figure out, do these guys know what they were doing? I'll tell you, they absolutely did. The incident commander that I got to talk to there, he, was, he had it, man. These, there was no question. This was a, what they call SEMA, which is the kind of alliance of emergency response people that all of the facilities use. Man, he knew what he was doing. The teams knew what they were doing. My main concern there was public sentiment. Not because of, you know, the oil and gas industry, just people were kind of panicking. And my big question I wanted answered was, is that big black cloud toxic? Look, it's a big black cloud. It's scary. I want to know if it was toxic. So I, after, after getting through this interview, I said, okay, I'm comfortable that while it, it's, it's got ash in it and it's, it's awful, and if you've got a lot of asthma, it could be a problem. Even talk to the EPA folks, talk to TCEQ folks, talk to all the 140-something air quality monitors were going on between different regulatory agencies with something like 200 different probes measuring for different toxins. All of them reading below concern levels. So I go on, they're going to do a press conference that afternoon. And I said, tell you what, I'm talking to the ITC folks, and I said, I will do the press conference with you. Because my main concern is public fear. And I want to address that. So I came on, I did the press conference. And I said, look, here's to the people of Houston, and I'm on KHOU live, and I said, here's what I know. I've, done, I've, I've gone there, I've talked to the incident commander myself. I have, uh, I've looked at the, the, the background of all this stuff. I've looked at what's in the cloud, I've looked at what's burning. Because, what's, you know, when benzene burns, the byproducts are CO2 and water. This is a, what, what's going on. We're, while the black cloud is scary and it looks awful, it's not toxic. And so I wanted people in the area to know they were safe. A couple hours later, I get home, and my wife says, hey, did you hear about the story on KHOU? I said, no, I didn't hear about the story. I mean, I, my story? I was on KHOU, I think. And she said, no, 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 the lady who followed up after you. I said, no. KHOU hears me make this announcement, and they've got somebody else sitting in their studio with them, a tox doc. She calls herself the tox doc. And the lady, the reporter, is hearing the story. She says, we just heard this commissioner, apparently he's an engineer, said that the tech cloud is not toxic. What do you think about that, tox doc? Tox doc said, I cannot believe he said that. That was totally irresponsible. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's not qualified to make that statement. We get Twitter responses back to my report saying, how dare you, railroad commissioner? How dare you make that announcement? Who are you? How will you be qualified? We've got this medical doctor saying that you're wrong. So we did a little research into the tox doc. Turns out she's not a medical doctor. She's a doctor of philosophy. <laughs> Turns out she's never been in a refinery before. Turns out she's never spent a day in the oil and gas business. Turns out her full-time occupation is selling health supplements. But this is the person that KHOU trotted out on their set to call me an idiot. And you know how often the EPA and I agree on stuff? Doesn't happen a lot. But the EPA agreed with me. The next day they came out and said, yeah, actually, we're doing all these tests. Nothing toxic. Nothing toxic in the cloud. Tox doc comes on. Those EPA guys are idiots. They don't know what they're talking about. How dare they? Once again, supplement salesmen telling the world that there's something to worry about. The simple message from all that was, there's a big black cloud and we're scared. And while we tried to explain, TCEQ, EPA, Railroad Commissioner, the, the company itself, SEMA, the industry, everyone saying, it's not toxic. It's big and it's black and it looks off, it's not toxic. The response, the simple message was, be afraid. And that was the message that resonated throughout Houston. We have a challenge in front of us, which is how do we combat this short attention span, right? We live in a world today where we are inundated with stuff. Anybody here use Facebook or Twitter or even just go on the internet and you're blitzed with ads and all sorts of information. We are becoming, we're becoming experts at sifting out information. We are, ex, we, are, we are programmed to accept very simple tidbits. Our challenge today is how do, we, how do we fight this? What are the simple messages that promote what we are doing? Let me tell you what they are. The first one is this. 
If someone asks you, hey, Cy, you're the incoming, you're the, you're the vice chairman, vice president of the alliance, right? You're going to be the future president. So when they say, are you pro oil and gas? You have to say, no. Wait a minute. That sounds fishy. You say, let me tell you what I am. I am pro affordable, reliable energy. You see, because that's what the people of this country want. They want affordable, reliable energy, and there's just no better way to do it than oil and gas. When people say, well, Ryan, tell me about water usage. I mean, you guys use a ton of water, right? You say, hey, we use a little bit, but we use less than one half of 1% of the amount of fresh water that's used in this state. The amount that we use is negligible. And with the advances that we're making in recycle, it could be that in a couple of years, we are actually net contributors to fresh water in this state. When people say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What about global warming? Are you concerned about global warming? And you can say this, yeah, I'm concerned about global warming. Wait, what? I thought, Ryan, you're an oil and gas guy. How do you say you're, look, I'm, I'm concerned about it. Fact is, the planet gets warmer and cooler. It's done that for a long time, long before we were pulling hydrocarbons out of the ground. And is it possible that the planet may experience another ice age? Possible. It happened several times before there was oil and gas. Probably going to happen in the future. Does it concern me? Yeah, it concerns what happens in the world. The question is, am I willing to sacrifice all of the development of mankind? Am I willing to sacrifice all of the food that we produce? with the cheap energy that we have? Am I willing to sacrifice all of the people whose lives are positively impacted because they have access to affordable, reliable energy based on a fear that may be completely unfounded? No, I'm not willing to do that. These are the simple messages that we've got to get really good at. And the reason I give you this very long preachy speech this morning at the Alliance is this. When you look at, well, who is it that's going to send that message? I was sitting at the table just now before I got up to talk, and I talked about the fact that in my entire 20 years in industry, there are, there are lots of industry trade associations. Nationally, we've got IPAA and API. Just here in Texas, we've got the Alliance, we've got TIPRO, we've got Texoga. We've got the major companies running their own ads, and even small companies kind of putting out their own media, their own announcements. And we don't always speak with one voice. And all those announcements get clouded. Some people actually even say different things, competing things, competing agendas. When we get to the legislature, some of your folks who are really active will tell you, yeah, sometimes, you know, the big companies and the small companies don't exactly have the same message. But when it comes to these big, simple ideas, we've got to be really, really clear. And that's where the alliance is very well positioned. Let's say, look, on behalf of all the independent oil and gas producers, on behalf of the thing we like to talk about, the mom and pop, the mom and pop operations, the, the family-owned businesses that create jobs and create new technology, support their communities, who absolutely are more concerned about what happens to the people in their neighborhood than anybody else around. To those people, we represent them. We represent their messages. And what we have to do is get very good at these very simple messages. We want to provide the world affordable, reliable energy. Not because, yes, do we want to make a buck doing it? Absolutely. We're not afraid to talk about that. However, when we think about the greater good, why is what we do so important to society? Who really benefits? Who really benefits from affordable, reliable energy? Is it those of us in this room? We benefit a little bit. But I would argue it is the family where the parents are both teachers, where they have to commute from a suburb, say Irving, to the other half of town or to downtown Dallas, where they are spending three, four, five, six percent of their income on gasoline alone. To them, the difference between $2 a gallon gas and $3 a gallon gas is the difference in taking a family vacation or not. I'm not saying this just anecdotally. That is the life I grew up in. I grew up right here in Irving, Texas. Both my parents were teachers. My mom taught chemistry. My dad taught physics. Now, they didn't have to drive a long way, but I remember at home, when mom and dad were saying, you know, it was like the early 80s, and we were towards the end of the 80s when I was in my, I was 8, 9, 10, 11 years old, and they were talking about the fact that, man, pretty soon we're going to have a dollar a gallon gas. <laughs> I remember them talking about, man, you know, if this keeps going, we're going to have to make changes. 
as we were growing up, the construction workers, you know, nurses, people work in all sorts of um, hourly jobs. To them, affordable, reliable energy has a huge impact on their lives. Those are the people that we serve. When we figure out a way to do it just a little bit cheaper, to produce just a little bit more, to drive that cost down just a tad, those people feel it. And that's who we go to serve. I'll finish with one other anecdote. Then, by the way, I'm going to take questions from you and talk about what you'd like to talk about. Yeah, there's a, there's an, there's a quintessentially pro-oil and gas component of, of me talking. Once again, not because I'm some sort of you know, generational oil and gas person. I've just come to appreciate the profoundly positive impact that affordable, reliable energy has on the world. But in case you think that, well, that's just some Republican politician up there talking, let me tell you what's happening in California right now. California is making decisions to try to advance a pro-environment agenda. And a couple things they are doing. One, as the federal subsidies for electric cars are expiring, the state of California is replacing those subsidies with their own. So if you live in the state of California today and you go down and you buy a $100,000 Tesla, you can get like a $5,000 rebate from the state government. That's the bill that's being considered right now in California. How many poor people do you know buy $100,000 Teslas? Do you know how they pay for those subsidies? Additional gasoline taxes. So think about this. That same teacher I was just talking about who is hoping and praying that her gasoline price drops by 10, 15 cents a gallon, is being forced to pay an additional 10 to 15 cents a gallon to subsidize some rich dude's Tesla. Do you think that's the intended consequence of the California legislation? And I'm not the only person who thinks this. Two years ago, California legislature decided in their infinite wisdom that they were going to stop expansion of roads. I'm not kidding. They decided, you know what, if we build more roads, that's only going to encourage more people to drive. I'm not kidding. They decided they were going to take this money that had been earmarked to build new roads and they're going to put it into something else. What was the response? A civil rights group in California sued the state of California. A civil rights group saying that what was happening in their words, in the lawsuit, I've got a copy of my car, in their words was resegregation. Because what the legislature was doing was making it so that Traffic was getting so bad that the price of homes inside the city was skyrocketing so that only rich white people in their lawsuit could afford those homes. And it was pushing blacks and Hispanics further and further out, which, of course, was forcing them to spend more money on gasoline. Their lawsuit was, you are doing things that intentionally, in their lawsuit, benefit white people and intentionally penalize Hispanics and blacks. This is not just a conservative poor oil and gas agenda. The things that we do benefit those in our society who are working the hardest to make a dollar, who are working the hardest. Maybe say this, to whom that dollar they're working for, that one dollar, is so critical. We've been really blessed. My wife and I, we started our own company, and these days, if the price of, gallon, price of a gallon of gasoline is up to $5 a gallon, I can pay that. I recognize that. I'm very blessed to be in that situation, but also there's a lot of people in this country who can't. And those are the people that we should have our minds on all the time. That's the message that we should carry with us all the time. So as we are thinking about what you do here at this alliance meeting, and what you challenge your alliance leadership to do is this. Guys, we need a simple message. One that will resonate with everybody. Not just the half a million Texans that are in the oil and gas business, but the 27 million Texans that call this state home who want to be proud of this industry that represents the biggest chunk of our economy. And when we talk about the people that we benefit, the positive impacts that we have on things like water and even on the environment, because we do it better, safer, and cleaner here in the state of Texas than anywhere else in the world. Those are things that not only people in industry should be proud of, but every single Texan should be proud of. The challenge for us is not with what we're doing, what, not whether or not what we're doing is right. It's can we put it into a nice, simple package that people out there can get excited about. If we do that well, then the Alliance will have accomplished what I believe should be its primary mission.